And welcome to today's lunch hour lecture, which is being given by Professor Angela Sasser of the, um, uh, the Computer Science Department. Um, we are not having any further uh, lectures this year. In fact, uh, Professor Sasser has kindly agreed to give this lecture after the normal course, um, as the, her previous lecture had to be cancelled. However, um, today, Professor Sasser is going to be talking about the end of passwords, which um, I think we will all be grateful for. Um, her background is in uh, psychology. Um, her first degree was from Germany in psychology. She then had further degrees in occupational psychology and computer science in England, and she worked for Philips thereafter. Um, she joined University College in 1990, and she's been here since. Professor Sasser. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so the, um, the end, this is for me, this is going to be the end of an era. Um, it's the end of an era in research. Uh, I've been, basically, this is a problem I've been wrestling with since the, uh, the mid-90s when um, I conducted a study at one of our commercial collaborators. And this was one of those moments of pure serendipity. I was working on the first generation of internet audio and video systems, um, the kind of things you're now using in, in terms of Skype and video conferencing. And serendipity is one of those sideways things when somebody said, like, you, you are a usability person by training. And I said, yes. And he said, well, we're having this problem um, that we're running these help desks for resetting passwords, and the accountants are complaining that the cost of running those help desks is going up. It, it trebled uh, every year for three years in a row. And the accountant said, where is this going? We can't, uh, this can't continue. And he said, so since you know about usability, could you do a quick study and tell us why these stupid users can't remember their passwords? <laughs> and that was, the, that was a sentence which is unfortunately very typical, but which actually launched my whole research in this area. So we did a quick study myself and my uh, PhD student, Anne Adams, and the results was, well, you're asking, um, in this case, this was BT employees, you're asking them to do something that's not humanly possible. Um, you have policies that um, say that um, your users have to have a different password for each of the system they use. You're expiring them every month. Um, they have to be, the passwords were, were at least eight characters long, and of course there couldn't be any words that you could remember. The pins were six digit long, and all of them had to change every month. And uh, the employees we looked at had between 16 and 64 of these different passwords. Um, and so the answer is, this is not humanly possible. Human memory doesn't work that way. Um, if you use a password frequently, you might be able to cope with two or three strong passwords. But if you have any of these compl complex um, pins or passwords, uh, and you don't use them several times every day from a human memory perspective, it's just not possible to do this. So um, this is what, what we said. But the um, security people kind of, to some extent, they dug, dug their heels in and put their hands in the sand. And what we said is like, you know, if you're doing this, what's actually happening now? Everybody is, um, you have these policies and you hold up these documents and say, look how secure we are. But in reality, everybody is doing workarounds. Um, everybody is sticking, you know, is basically doing various things such as sticking the passwords up or sharing them. Um, and the users stop paying attention to you because you say one thing to them where they go like, you know, this is, this is just, you know, the users were responding with like, the policies are stupid, this is not possible. So they stopped taking security seriously. And it really led to a state of war between the employees in the company and the security department that were threatening sanctions and, you know, if, if, if they caught anybody doing workarounds and the users just got better at hiding it. But from the, the employee's point of view, it was really just something, you know, that security was something that was made to torture them, to get in the way. And that's um, definitely not a good place where you want to be. And so this, this was the paper we published, which has become one of the, the classics in security research. Um, it's very interesting if you now look back at what happened. Um, both usability professionals and security professionals didn't really do very much. 
we got a little bit of movement in that, that in the, when we were working with the company, they started looking at what we know today as a single sign-on. Um, so the idea that if you were interacting with 16 to 64 different systems, you shouldn't have to log into each of these systems individually, that you could put a gateway on the front. Um, and once you'd signed into that gateway, it would log you into, into various things further down. Um, but the, um, I think security uh, practitioners in particular assumed there would be a technology, there would be a silver bullet that would mean passwords would go away. And so Bill Gates, um, who, who you probably all know who he is, and Bruce Schneier, who's the most famous security researcher, so he's secu um, according to his latest book uh, title, Book Front, um, the closest thing security has to a rock star. Um, <laughs> um, they basically were, were really completely unperturbed and they just said, well, there will be another technology coming along and that will replace passwords and then we can stop worrying about it. And Jacob Nielsen, who is who's the most famous usability person, said, oh, you know, they'll be replaced by biometrics and biometrics are inherently usable because you don't have to remember anything. Um, if you've recently used some of the passport gates at Heathrow or one of the other airports, you might disagree with the <laughs> statement that biometrics are immediate and inherently unusable. So researchers actually did respond, and there, there was a whole sort of um, air, um, group of, of um, researchers coming together, mostly from, from the security engineering point of view, but also from usability, and they created this field called usable security. And they created their own conference. They managed to get tracks into them in the major conferences in security and usability. Um, in the US, they had a, had a whole um, workshop in, by the National Academies, and that then led to the National Science Foundation funding a whole program called Secure and Trustworthy Computing, where usability um, figures very large. And I, um, I, there's roughly about 800 papers now on usable security. And the majority of those, the single most studied mechanism, is on authentication. And so you might say, like, oh, great, you know, what have these guys come up with? Um, so there is, is, is a, lot of is, a lot of this involves pictures, <laughs> is one answer. Because the reasoning was, well, um, pictures are more uh, memorable than passwords, um, than any type of passwords, and, and faces are particularly memorable. We can always remember pictures. And so why don't we just replace a four-digit pin with four panels of faces like this? And so you have basically one, um, one face in each panel that is your, um, basically the equivalent of your number, and the others are what we call distractors. Well, the answer was, I mean, this is actually a commercial product and it's been around, but clearly it's not um, made, it made the way to replace passwords everywhere. Uh, there's two main reasons for it. From a security point of view, what they found is that actually the faces that people were picking were not evenly distributed. Um, particularly, men tend to all um, congregate on, on a very small number of those faces. So up to 60% of men would always choose the same picture in one of these, the one that looked most like a female model. Uh, the, um, the other problem with this was that some colleagues in 2009 did a study where they showed that if you have more than one password, so if you have two accounts or if you have to change the password, that the memorability that you normally find, you know, that this, these, these things um, people can you often up to three months, you find that over 90% can actually remember. Um, their, their past faces. That would be quite good from a memorability point of view for something that you use infrequently. Um, but as soon as you have more than, more than one, then the memory performance basically declines. Um, the, we've had loads and loads of different uh, picture-based mechanisms. And a lot of the time when they're being discussed, they talk about the security of those mechanisms. And so they say like, well, you know, an attacker shouldn't be able to just randomly click on these pictures and get, get you know, the password just by, by doing that, by clicking around. And so uh, they say like, well, you should really have um, a mechanism like this, where any point where you click on the picture, it will bring up another picture. Only if you click, up on, click on your particular location, it brings up the next picture, which you know, and then on, 
Um, whereas if you click on another one, it'll bring up another picture and so, so on. And they basically spend a lot of time researching like how big does the box have to be so that it's easy for the, leg for the legitimate user who recognizes their location to uh, select it, but for somebody who is clicking around randomly um, not, to, not to get it. Uh, it's all sorts of like draw secret where it came up where um, you're drawing a shape. And so this is actually a combination with a biometric where it looks at not just the shape that you draw, but it looks at how you draw it. Uh, and then that would be a way of getting in. The problem is here, you find that there are very few that, that people choose a very small number of, of different shapes. They essentially tend to congregate in, in one place. Um, and so then again, we try to make that better by putting a picture underneath. This is from a, from a colleague um, in Newcastle. We've also had an attempt to have one-time PIN authentication. So here, the security argument was, well, actually, once if somebody observes your PIN, then it's compromised. We don't want that. So what we, what we want is to have a different PIN every time. And so what you get is when you... Um, when you basically, uh, when you're trying to use that, it, you, you have a device, either it's on your computer or it might be on your phone, where it gives you a grid, and the secret that you share with the computer is a location. Let's assume just the bottom, basically these bottom four, where we currently have the 6284. If the secret between me and the computer is that that is the location, um, and every time I connect to the system, it, it will show me a different set of numbers, and I read off the numbers in my secret location, and that is the one-time pin that I enter. Um, so um, that is actually a commercial product, which is, which is part of an offering from a company called, um, called SafeNet. Uh, and it's used on an administrator interface to, to computer systems. When they tried to, they, the company tried very hard to push this into the consumer sector, but one of the problems they encountered was that people like you and me would pick what you could call very predictable locations. So most people would pick simple shapes and they would put something that, pick something that's on, somewhere touches the edge, and they would always read off the numbers starting top left to bottom right. And, um, if you can give people the instruction and say like, hey, look, you know, this is a very simple shape that everybody else, that, that a lot of people will pick, um, but it's very diff different, difficult to stop people reading off once you have a particular shape to read off the numbers top left to bottom right. And that means that on a five by five grid, there's not that many different passwords. And that again, isn't good from a security point of view. You can try and improve that by making the grid bigger but then, of course, it gets very hard for people to um, remember exactly where the shape is. So they might uh, remember that they had a square, but where exactly on the grid the square was, the, the bigger you make the grid, the harder that becomes. So this um, tension between usability and security seemed very difficult to, to square. Um, but it didn't deter my colleagues. There have been an incredible amount of different proposals. So from um, friends at Microsoft, authentication via Rorschach inkblot tests. If, if you've seen the things that, that psychiatrists some, uh, sometimes use to, to diagnose things, singing your password at the computer. Um, hopefully you're in a good mood when you're doing that. Um, thinking your password and you get a free, in, and the e, it's read off via an EEG, um, so you get, get a free brain diagnosis thrown in. Lots of different forms of biometrics were proposed. But you have to say, you know, how practical is this? How expensive would it be to deploy the technology on the range of different computers and devices we have? Um, and none of this really made headway. Then other friends at Microsoft came up with the idea um, and this is really something that we, as we have seen happening in practice, is you start layering more and more authentication. So if people forget the passwords and running help desks to reset the password becomes too expensive, you basically put a self-service reset in place. Now, that means you have to remember more things. <laughs> Because, you know, I have to go and basically uh, register, you know, what was the name of your first pet or what's the make of your fridge. And um, your mother's maiden name maybe is something that's asked very often. And if you think that's maybe not very secure because somebody can just go to my Facebook page and look up some of this information, 
you and you you come up with a fake answer, then of course, if if seven eight months later you suddenly need to go to the page, well, you better um, have a very good memory for w what lie you told to whom <laughs> about uh, about these things. So um, that failed. So then they came up with the idea, which is now actually implemented in Facebook as well. Oh, you have lots of friends, right? So if your friends say it's you, then we will reset your password. So you have to nominate three friends. Um, and if um, they confirm, you need to give them a code. And then they, if they log in and they confirm, I've spoken to you. And yeah, I can really see my friends will love this. And then if I ring them up in the middle of the night and I say, you remember that, that thing, I, that, that number I gave you <laughs> six or seven months ago? Um, could you please go and find it and log in and, and confirm that it's me? Um, so I could see that's a practical, um, a practical problem. The other problem is, of course, that when they first trialed this, after three weeks, um, not even 70% of the participants in their study could remember all three friends that they had nominated. <laughs> so clearly, um, we're, we're asking... Um, the, the, the practice, the, this is, has been a repeating theme, that once you, you really look at, well, what would it mean in practice, these things fall apart. And when Philip Ingelson and I did a follow-up study in another company 10 years after users are not the enemy, we found that um, in a company that had introduced a single sign-on, well, there weren't 16 to 64 different passwords. The introduction of a single sign-on had brought the number down, but they still had six to eight different ones. And when you look at the reason for that, that's really the way things have gone in companies. Lots of things are contracted out, whether um, this is you have information services coming in, like Reuters and Bloomberg, the gym is contracted out, um, the travel may be contracted out, and so on. And for all these services, the providers all want separate authentication. So it does add up very quickly. Um, and it was still a problem at the... the T uh, the amount of time people spend thinking up and entering passwords adds up very quickly. So uh, the line I usually use when I, when I go and try to convince a board that they should think about something different than passwords is, do you realize your employees spend three weeks a year just logging in? <laughs> they look at me sort of like, the, and they go like, that's not possible. And I can assure you this is possible. When you start adding up the time, um, in this day and age where we have automatic stream banks kicking in after 10 to 15 minutes of non-activity, um, when it can take somebody when their password expires, and then the system says, oh, it must be strong, um, and it can't be any, it has to be sufficiently different from the one you used before, it can't be a word, um, and you must have all these things, that people sit there for 10 to 15 minutes trying to come up with a valid password, with a valid new password, the system will accept. And once you add all of those things up, it is a, a huge um, a huge load. You know, then also start adding up all the self-service research services that you need to think up those credentials and add it up. And it's just, well, a significant amount of a drain on our time. Um, and it creates stress. Uh, my co some colleagues from the US Department of Transport came up with this, where they said, if you look at all the, the factors, like the number of passwords we have, we have to change them, um, they're, they're complex. Um, we are also anticipating what happens if I forget, if I get locked out, and then I can't get an important job done. That's starting to stress you. Um, and if you put all these things together for the users, it feels like a pressure cooker, right? And, and the, the quickest way of getting somebody to, to thump the table and go like, you know, uh, here's something I hate about technology is just to say, tell me about your passwords. And it happens, of course, at work and at home. So all the time that we're spending, my, my um, Comac, uh, Comac Hurley, who's a colleague from Microsoft in Redmond, had basically said, the real problem we have is in the thinking of the security experts, the effort that people have to spend on the security mechanism um, is they, 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 the value for the security people is zero. They think they can ask for any amount of effort. But in reality, is when you look at online transactions, when you look within a company, people's time is valuable. And in, in, in the US context, he co uh, calculated this massive figure that people are, are wasting um, because of, of passwords online. The security people retort by saying security is important. Users should make an effort. But the question, and no, until recently, nobody had said, 
where is the where is the limit? Where is the line? How much effort is reasonable, and how much is not? So if you if you start you for yourself, if you kept a diary and you start writing down all the time you spend on online security measures, it starts to become a significant amount on um, a drain on your time. Uh, and because there is, of course, passwords is only one of several authentication of uh, several security mechanisms that you need to inter interact with. If you fail on any of those things, the amount of time you can spend trying to get your credentials back and being able to get into a service can be, can be quite significant. And at work, that happens as well. Um, and the other thing that actually happens at work that is, is a significant drain is it disrupts. Nobody goes to work because they do security, except for our <laughs> small number of people who are security experts. Everybody has to get a job done, and the disruption that security mechanisms, IT security mechanisms, are causing to our productive activity, this has really reached a point now where it's become untenable uh, and where it can't continue. What we, um, what we discovered, this is um, from, from a study we did for the US National Institutes of Standards and Technology, where we actually looked at what happens during the course of a day, but then also talked to people about how it had changed, how the, the frequent disruption of their task had changed the way they work. We actually found uh, that it, it really had quite a significant impact. So it's not just the time that you spend on, on entering a password and all the associated tasks. It's when you get when your productive activity gets disrupted, you have to once you finish the security task, you go, um, and where was I? <laughs> and that basically means we found that uh, up to 40% of the effort you'd already spent on the primary task had to be redone. And when you start adding all those things up, the, uh, the amount of time and um, productive, uh, uh, the cost to productive activity that IT security measures cause is just pretty um, gigantic. And it causes still um, stress and frustration. So uh, our participants in this study, they helped us to, to put together a hate list of things they hated most about passwords. Um, first one was this, I've, I've been sitting here for two hours and I haven't moved. But if I don't touch the keyboard for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, the screen kicks in and I have to prove yet again um, who I am. And they just think that is, that is unreasonable. And actually, it's the combination of all the different policies around the passwords and other mechanisms, such as screen locks, that really um, that create a massive load. Authenticating to infrequently used systems. So here, uh, we literally uh, found that, that our participants had passwords for systems that only logged in once or twice a year. Uh, some people only travel once or twice a year, and that means they only need to claim expenses once or twice a year, for instance. But they had to reset their passwords every 90 days. So two or three times within a year, they were doing that. They had to sit there, think up a new strong password that complied all, with all those things for a password they never used. Right? All they used it for was to keep the password alive. And you look at that and you go, that's not sensible, is it? Um, if we're logging into systems infrequently, maybe we should give people a one-time <laughs> credential, you know, a, a password, a list of, um, of passwords you print down and you use it once and then you cro cross it off the list. That would surely be a more sensible way of dealing with this. Um, creating a valid password with all the restrictions, with the amount of computing power we have available today, what, what happens is that even if you have a relatively long password and that is complicated, the time that it would take for a so-called brute force attack to succeed comes, comes down and the cost of doing this has come down. And so they make us have longer passwords and more complicated passwords. Um, and it's, it's reached the point where people just think <laughs> this is ridiculous, right? And, and we're, we're coming back to that theme that, that, that the, the uh, users in my first study expressed. You know, they go, this is, this is silly, you know, we can't possibly, can't possibly do this. Um, the high number of different credentials, from a memory point of view, a really unfortunate thing is we've got these credentials, more credentials at work, and now we also have loads of credentials in our private life. 
And you, ca you can't have a Chinese wall in your head. You can't go home and say, like, no, I forget all my pa uh, work passwords and I just remember my online banking and my private stuff and vice versa. They're all in there. They're all sitting in the similar memory partition and competing with each other. And that, um, contri uh, that contributes to the misery. Others also said they had a two-factor authentication, meaning they had, um, which some of you also may have for online banking, they basically had a token where they had to go. And they say, well, if I forget the token, or it's somewhere at the bottom of my bag, you know, by the time I've, I've turned over the bag and dug the whole thing out, a couple of minutes have gone all of this ads up. So the impact on productivity is, is actually starting to show in some organizations. So um, people start to, to basically prioritize their productivity, and that means they are batching, they're organizing their work to minimize the exposure to security. And that can, for organizations, be a significant problem, because if they assume that certain activities are being done continuously, but people are actually batching them, then you have other people waiting further down the line for things that aren't arriving or only arrive in batches. Um, the, um, the stifling innovation, we had people telling us we could basically get something done by getting, um, giving other people access to our network, but I can't stomach the fight, so we'll just plod on and try and solve this problem by ourselves uh, and it'll be later and it won't be as good as we could if we, if we could have a collaboration and give these other people access to our network, so, but I can't take it. And also literally people leaving to say, this is too much of a drain on my productivity uh, and I'm not getting done what I want to get done, I'll go and work somewhere where the security isn't so, so good. So the impact on uh, the iron irony, however, is, is that when the security people jump up and down and say, like, you know, we must have more security, the reality is you're not getting security because of all the workarounds that people do in order to cope. Uh, the, um, the, they make mistakes um, or they, um, they basically don't realize they're not following the policy um, anymore. And what happens then is they don't realize that they're, they're doing things they're not supposed to do. They're writing, writing, um, they're writing passwords down and sharing them. And this, um, this was in the brochure that went to a shareholders meeting and was sent to thousands of people before somebody realized the server passwords were written on the password. We, I, have, I have half a dozen examples of, of these things being caught on TV um, and going where where basically this was for the weather hotline, where um, the password is winter14. And you go and look at this, well, you know, that's not a very strong password, and you're displaying it for, why, it really begs the question, why do you have a password in the first place? But the point here is, is that if everybody gets used to breaking the rules and, and disclosing passwords, then they forget the fact that they do that, and the resulting security is not very good. So, um, this is old security, and we have we, we passed the threshold last year where the majority of passwords input were not from keyboards anymore, but from touchscreen tablet devices. And entering a complex password on a touchscreen device takes three to five times as long as entering it on a keyboard for, for a practice typist, and the number of errors is three to five times as high, meaning we're multiplying the entire ex extortionate cost we've already discussed even further. And what you can find is um, in, a colleague in one organization told me that he'd observed that the number of different passwords that people had, that his employees had, went down from about 1,000 different passwords to 20. Because over a period of 18 months, the uh, without colluding, the employees had figured out how you can comply with the password policy, but only toggle between the, um, the different keywords keyboards you have on the touch screen device, only toggling once um, in order to speed up the entry on these things. So, great security? No. Um, and when you basically get this on a new device, they, they really silly things happen. So, this is a crypto card, which um, American organizations buy because they stop trusting the, the uh, most widely used token, the RSA token, because of where it's manufactured. And so, okay, now you have a more secure token. And then they said, oh, goody, it's got a display that can do uh, letters as well as numbers. So instead of reading off a six number time code, what we can do is we can make people read off an eight character complex password. 
and you go, what? So if you're practiced, you can read off a six-digit time code and enter it in one go. It's utterly impossible to do that with an eight-character alphanumeric string. You'll need to go backwards and forwards two to three times the error uh, likely or psychic. And when it's only displayed, the code is only valid for one minute, you go like, <laughs> what increase in security were you actually trying to get? Forget it. So I think we can summarize the digital natives are getting restless. If Wired demands that we kill the password, um, change is definitely on the way. How could we do this? So one suggestion is not to look for a replacement for the password, but I think what we need is a large scale switch from explicit authentication where we go like, you know, this is me and here's my password to prove it. Uh, and where we just say the system recognizes us. And we have various technologies available, whether this is our location, which our phone knows about, proximity sensors, various biometrics that can be combined to achieve this. I mean, for God's sake, the people who are trying to breach our privacy and track us everywhere we go, they can recognize us in split seconds flat using the information that's available about us out there. But when our devices are trying to recognize us, the legitimate users, we have to make all this effort. This is crazy. Um, the question is, can we actually have low effort authentication and still keep our privacy and still have meaningful consent? There are various technologies um, being discussed, such as, for instance, using a near field communication ring, which you put so your smartphone knows where you are and, and that it's you. Um, but to say, yes, I really want to buy something, you put, um, you put basically um, a ring or, or a piece of jewelry that has, has a sensor in over it and says, yes, yes, I confirm, please do this. So the technologies are around. If you're interested in this, please have a look at the website of the PICO project of my colleague Frank Stagiano at Cambridge, who's he's working with a very big grant from the European Commission on a replacement for passwords. Um, and they're trying out various ways of having a combination of devices giving various levels of assurance, but all without the user having to do very much at all. Um, the big boys, Google, eBay, and so on, have also banded together and formed the FIDO Alliance, whose motto is forget passwords. They say a com using a combination of tokens, location, and data, um, we can authenticate you. If, you're, uh, if you are a UCL employee, you might have also noticed that there is um, that we can go between different educational institutions using our passwords. So having fed federated authentication, um, that means you don't have to have a different password everywhere you go. The, um, they are also being... Um, being um, I really like this solution, um, also, which is very practical and looking at consumers. In the US, you can have a passphrase. So if you have an Amazon account and you have a family, you don't have to buy stuff for people anymore when they go like, you know, because that, that tends to be the reality. There's only one person who has an account and the credit card tied to it. You can delegate, you can set, you can give them a simple passphrase um, and you can also control what is what each of the people who you delegate to can spend, how much they can spend, what they can spend it on. And when you think about it, you suddenly go like, it's electronic pocket money, right? Now that's, a, that's the more innovative way of thinking of, you know, what is it that people are trying to get done rather than put a huge security wall in the place. It's got to disappear it's into our daily activities. It's got to go away. So the conclusion is, I think the end of passwords is nigh. But um, if we, uh, we need to, in order to make it happen, we need more pressure. So in the commercial space, clearly time is money and money talks. And so pointing out um, the waste uh, that's being done, the damage to productivity that's being done by unwieldy security is the way forward. And that's what I and my colleagues um, here in the, in the usable security team um, at UCL are working on. In the consumer space, I think consumers it should be rioting. If a bank asks that you have a 20-digit password and then on demand um, produce the third, the 12th, and the 20th character of it, you should say no. <laughs> you say no, I'm not a trained monkey who's got nothing better to do all day. Uh, and um, so I basically refuse to, to use those services for that reason, and also because the terms and conditions, when you read them carefully, say if anything goes wrong, it's my problem anyway. 
um, where whether they, you know, they may not enforce it on, on a desirable customer like me, but in principle, I still think we should object. You know, these problems need to be solved in a way that's equitable and manageable by the providers and by the consumers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Angela. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, we have one over here. Hi. Uh, on that point about uh, voting with your money, I wonder if there's any kind of, uh, I guess I could do my own searches, but do you think these portals are coming which will, which will rank banks according to friend unfriendliness to the, to the uh, customers trying to authenticate themselves? Yes, that's actually, that's a great idea. So we've been working on um, measuring the workload of different forms of authentication and publicizing that w is, would definitely be a good way forward to shame um, providers into, in, into, into investing in more usable solutions. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Yes, at the back, yeah. Do things like biometrics work? You know, eye scanner things and fingerprint and, you know, because you always carry a body around with you. Yes. And um, just thought that might be easier. I think biometrics will definitely have a role to play in, uh, in future solutions. The, I think some of the problems we had in the past with, with systems is that they, um, there was, so much interest and demand for it that they pushed the systems out of the lab and into deployment without really testing them properly and making them work properly. Um, in, in one study I, I, was, uh, I worked on, which was, done, which was done in Germany, we actually found that in a face recognition system, um, it, <laughs> at the end of a study, we found it recognized one group of users better than everybody else and that those were males between the age of 25 and 39 with a science and engineering degree. <laughs> Which tells you about that, that basically the only people that really tested this on, and this has been for a long time, has been a real problem that biometrics, the people who, and the type of company that developed the solutions don't really have the knowledge or the resources to conduct the studies that, that need to be conducted in order to make this technology work well enough. And then you also have the problem that the people who uh, buy this assume this is something you can buy out of a box and put down and it will work. As this gets into the consumer space, when you get some of the big boys like Amazon and, and Google and so on involved who have a vested interest in making it easy and making it work, I think the, basically that will raise the bar. And as long as, um, as these, um, they, they are researched and tested properly from a usability point of view, and as long as privacy considerations um, are, are also being heeded, that, that they think about whether there are privacy implications and how you manage those properly, I think biometrics have a future. It's, it's really amazing on a touch uh, screen, for instance, on your phone, the way that you mishit the keys is very idiosyncratic and very systematic. So you could have a simple password and, um, and uh, enter it and the way, and, and it would use the fact that you know the password and the way you mishit it as a two-factor authentication proof. Could be, it really can be done. It's what we call zero effort, one step, two-factor authentication. <laughs> Thank you, yes, we have another question here. Um, on that point of uh, using biometrics, if it's the type of biometrics where we're really looking at the recognition of something like fingerprints or uh, using irises, are there not going to be inherent issues with the way that our body changes? That is to say, you go outside, you try and access your phone, your fingers are cold, so the skin in your fingers contracted, or you begin to suffer from some kind of ocular degenerative disease which changes the shape of what's going on in your eye. Surely that's a very inevitable and somewhat insurmountable issue for uh, biometric research. There, there is no biometric that is 100% stable, apart from, from DNA, that is 100% stable over a long period of time. 
Uh, and but the the question is always is is what is you know who is using it um, for for which task and in which particular context are you using it and is this a context where you need to assure um, that the biometric works over a period of ten to twenty years? I think in quite a lot of contexts that's not not what you not not what you need. Um, I think the, the focus was on, on, on sort of like what I would call big biometrics, which is what governments were looking at for identity cards, passports, and things like that. Um, but the practical solutions are, what, uh, are often the ones that are um, that would be, I think, quite non, you know, not privacy invasive. So actually, the big hit at the moment is is butt recognition. <laughs> It's in cars, basically high in, in high-end vehicles. Um, it's it's now being deployed. Um, so when you get into the car, in order to overcome the immobilizer, you don't have to, you know, just it recognizes the driver sitting down. And what it does at the same time, if you think about it in the context of of shared, you know, we're more and more sharing cars. It's not like one owner, one car. Um, the, it recognizes the driver and also adjust the mirrors, the seat position, and everything automatically. And that is exactly the kind of ways that we should think. You know, how does it help with everything, not just about how do I prove this is the owner? It's got to disappear into the, the goals we are, we are trying to achieve, such as I want to get in the car and I want to be able to, to get, if I'm a legitimate registered owner, I should be able to get in and go as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. And so this kind of like, like thinking of not just about, you know, I'm keeping all the legitimate people out and put up a high wall that they have to come out. No, I'm trying to make people's, you know, the legitimate user's life easier. That kind of thinking, and it means we can use biometrics that I think are not as intrusive as you might fear with, with something like Iris. Um. Well, thank you very much, Angela. I think it's probably time that we have to stop, but I'm sure you'd like to join with me in thanking Professor Sasse once more for a very interesting. <laughs> thank you very much.